All right, and here we are. Uh, we're, we're at the end, or I shouldn't say perhaps not the end, the beginning. We are to the point where this is the last planned confirmation class I, I have, and I, I'm going to do it in the sanctuary here for a reason that I think will soon be obvious, maybe, or hopefully obvious in a point. Um, but we're done with the classes that I'm going to teach. Um, now, I, I say this in part because I haven't gotten a whole bunch of stump the chump questions coming in to where I'd say, oh, oh well. So, I mean, yeah, if you, if you still have other questions, I'll be glad to talk. But this is going to be the, the, the last one that I, I'm planning on and saying that we, uh, we have to do. Um, what I would note is that this is not so much an end as it is a beginning. And what do I mean by that? Um, too often we can think of confirmation as the hoop we jump through and we go through it and then we're done and yay, we're done. No, no, no. Um, confirmation means you can start on the path, the journey of your being an adult Christian. Um, I went through driver's ed when I was 16, actually just before I turned 16. And by the time I completed driver's ed, that did not mean, oh, I know all there is to know about driving a car, and I'm as good a driver as I'll ever be. No, it meant I could handle a car safely. It meant I knew enough to, uh, where I, I knew enough where I could be let out on my own. And um, and in fact, I would say that now I am a much better driver than I was when I was 16, and and that I I had the tools to continue to grow and use that skill. This is what your confirmation is. The point of this class wasn't to give you all the information about Jesus and his love for you that you need to know or would ever want to know. It was to give you the basics so that you could keep learning as an adult. And I would hope that you would go back to the catechism again and again and again. For the uh, devotionals that I'm doing, um, every morning at 8.30. I'm going through a section of the catechism each time into them. And they're wonderful, they're familiar. I keep seeing new things in them daily as I go through them. And I, I have them up there, and I, I know that some of the people who are watching and listening um, may not have looked at them since the time they were confirmed. But the beautiful thing about Luther's small catechism is that those six chief parts that we've gone over, the, the stuff that I make you repeat, gives you a basic, solid grounding for so many of the things that you will end up doing in your life, so many of the things you'll end up experiencing as a Christian. It will give you a framework to, to understand them, uh, lenses like glass lenses by which to see them, to put things into focus, or... Uh, or if you want to think about it this way, it's like fundamentals. I, I, I was watching The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan Chicago Bull documentary. And in the very first episode, there's this scene where, where Michael Jordan's in Paris and he's got his son next to him. And Michael Jordan's just there dribbling with his left hand, not watching, not paying attention. And his son next to him is dribbling with his left hand, not watching, paying attention, not not looking at the hand, because that's what you got to do. you got to be able to dribble without looking. You've got to be able to feel. And, and uh, Michael's going, don't mess up, don't mess up. And you could see that the, the younger kid was learning the fundamentals. But yet, even there, Michael Jordan, the best basketball player in the world, was still practicing the fundamentals, and he used that all the time in the game. This is what confirmation class is supposed to be. This is what the small catechism is supposed to be. It is the, the basic fundamentals that, that you can work on, that you can practice, that you can live in, and then using the game however it comes out to be played. And I will say that I have enjoyed teaching this class. I, I will admit I was nervous because it was a, 10 of you, that, that was a lot of folks to try to keep engaged. A lot of folks to try and pay attention, try to pay attention to, and make sure that you're all uh, dribbling when you're supposed to be dribbling. Um, but I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you continue to learn from me. Um, I do.
comes to Bible study. I preach. I hope to see you often when we can actually see each other. And I, I'm going to be around to answer questions, but I would point out one other thing, too. Um, God willing, you'll have other pastors besides me. I'm 42. I think I will end up running around as a pastor for another 20, maybe 25 years. I hope you guys certainly live longer than 25 years. Um, I hope you go on to many and great, wonderful things. I hope you have fantastic pastors all that time. I, I was thinking about this before I started class. Obviously, the, the biggest pastor in my life would be my dad, but my dad wasn't my pastor until I got to high school. And before my, my dad got to high school, I, I had Pastor Dalian, and I learned many great things from Pastor Dalian. I had uh, Pastor Rustert, and I had Pastor Saunders, who I, I've quoted in this class. And then even after I was off at college, I had Pastor Narens, and I learned fantastic things from Pastor Narens. And I, I had Pastor Cage and, and so many other folks while I was at the seminary that I, I worked with, that I learned from Pastor Burfine, Pastor, just so many. And the thing is, that's not part of the past. Even I, as a pastor, continue to learn. Now I, I end up having guys who are my colleagues, I guess, and, and they're not necessarily responsible for my spiritual care the way a pastor is. But I learned plenty from Pastor Swirla, Pastor Jewel, Pastor... <laughs> still Pastor Aaron, still still my dad. Still Pastor, Pastor Riley, sometimes Pastor Saunders. So the, the point is, while I, it is an honor for me to be your pastor, God will send many other people into your life to teach you, to speak God's word to you, to, to go through the scriptures with you, to give you forgiveness. And really, the, the catechism, as you have learned it, is the groundwork that lets you play along with the pastors, that lets you go along with where they're going, that, that also lets you spot the coots from the folks who are actually teaching God's word. Because, hey, I've been around, I can tell you lots of crazy people. Um, just because someone says that they are uh, uh, a pastor and speaking for God doesn't mean they have any clue what they're talking about. doesn't mean that they're preaching Christ and him crucified. And with the small catechism, with the Apostles' Creed, you have that groundwork to be able to spot people who are off base. People are trying to lead you astray. So uh, I'd encourage you to, to keep in with the fundamentals for a long time, um, for the rest of your life. Now, having said all that, I want to go over a little bit with what will happen with confirmation itself. First of all, I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to have to play things by ear. Yes, I'm sure you're sick of playing things by ear. Um, if I can speak as an old fogey, yes, all of this is annoying. But it's also something that in 30 years you'll be able to tell the young ones, Oh yeah, I remember. Blah, 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 blah. Or... Uh, your kids are complaining about confirmation class. Let me tell you what happened with my confirmation class. It, it, all hardship ends up becoming a, 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 an interesting story you get to tell down the road. Um, normally, the way the confirmation class would work or would end is we'd have the nice little meal. And, the, and then for the actual day of confirmation, uh, it would be in a church service. And I hope to do that. Same way too here. I just don't know when, because I don't know when we'll be able to. And y'all would end up sitting. Ooh, let's see, can I do this? Right up front. And after the sermon, I'd have you come right over here to the communion rail. And you would end up standing and then eventually kneeling. And we'd go through. Oh, I'm sure that looked beautiful to watch. Uh, we, we'd go through the rite of confirmation. And what I want to do is I want to go through that right now so you know what's going on with it. It's found on page 272 in your hymnal if you want to turn there. And I'm going to pause in the middle of it and give commentary on it because, I mean, I figure I might as well teach. So um, when it's time for the confirmation, I would have you all come on up. And it says, the pastor addresses the catechumen. That would be you. You who are studying the catechism. 
Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, that is, as you may know, the Great Commission. I want to note something about that because I was talking here elsewhere. Um, we hear that wrong in English. We hear, therefore, go, because we, we want to make a, a concrete verb. Really, it's all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you'll be going and making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son, teaching them to observe. They're, they're all participles. They're all, this is what's going to happen. The normal life of the church is the word goes out, and people are baptized, and people are learning. And you've been baptized, and you've been learning, and so you're part of this long process that got this long pattern that God has established, that Jesus talks about even at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. So we continue. You've been baptized and catechized. Ah, what a wonderful fancy word for taught. In the Christian faith, according to our Lord's bidding, Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my fathers in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my fathers in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace, and joyously give answer to what I now ask in the name of the Lord. So yes, the rite of confirmation is a public confession. The church is a public thing. This is why this, this shutdown is so weird for us. We're, we're designed to gather. It's, there, there's plenty of time for, for studying the word of God and devotion and worship privately in your homes. But there is that time where we're called together. Remember, the, uh, the word church actually is... Now I kind of miss my dry erase board. Ecclesia, which means the called out ones. We're, we're called out from our normal homes, called together into the, the body of Christ. It's a public thing. And so before the congregation, you get to make a public confession of your faith. Now, this could be very intimidating if I said, I want each of you to explain in your own word. No, no. You'll get to answer together. Why? Because that's all we do anyway. I, I, my job as a pastor is not to make new stuff up. My job is to take what Christ has said in his word and to speak it again and again and again. We don't have to do things new all the time. We just <laughs> repeat what Jesus says and said, yes, that is right. And so as part of this, we have a bunch of questions that I will ask. And I'm going to go over the questions now. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? And y'all would answer, yes, I do. This is why we went over the gifts of baptism. In baptism, you were rescued from sin and Satan and death. You were brought into God's kingdom. And you're saying, yes, I acknowledge, I, I get that I'm in God's kingdom, that I am a baptized child of God, that I am an heir of eternal life. Do you, do you get this? Yeah, I do. Say, yes, I do. Don't go, yeah, I do. <laughs> All right. Second question. Do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Now, what does it mean to renounce? Ooh, we don't use that word that often. To renounce is to say I'm not on his side. Um, if I were to suddenly say I'm no longer an American citizen, I'm going to go become a citizen of France. And I, I became a French citizen, I would renounce my, my American citizenship. As a Christian, we renounce our allegiance to the devil. We, we, well, let me go over the next two questions. Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. We acknowledge that, that the Christian life, that, that being baptized, that being brought into the kingdom of God, is not just always sunshine and daisies, but it is also the fact that we are called to strive against Satan, against sin, against temptations. That, that I know I have temptations. And as a Christian, it's my job to fight against them. And when I have failed, to confess them, to receive forgiveness. So, um, the next part, the next three questions are a question and answer version of the creed. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Okay, now note, 
I, I paused and started going into the rhythm again. This is why I've had you guys speak stuff together, because you're going to basically say the creed together, uh, article by article. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. And the reason why we went over the creed is so that you know, yes, this is what we do believe. Um, the beautiful thing about the section on the Apostles' Creed in the Catechism is that it's a constant reminder or refrain of what God does give to us, that God is our creator who gives us physical blessing, that that he redeems us, that, that we're saved by Christ, and that, that even the salvation is not something that we do. The faith that believes the salvation is a gift from God, worked by the Holy Spirit. And when you see that, when you see God at work for you, in you, through you, for you, in spite of all the things going on in the world, it does give incredible peace and confidence. And uh, just as general advice, when things do go rough, remember Christ Jesus for you. On to the next question. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures, in other words, the Old Testament and the New Testament, to be the inspired word of God? I do. When, when, we do the, uh, when I do the, the readings over there at the lectern, I end them, this is the word of the Lord. And the congregation says, thanks be to God. It's not just our opinion, but this is what God has said. And that ends up being the, the basis on how we understand who God is. We, we accept his word as true. The next question. Do you confess the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, drawn from the scriptures as you've learned to know it from the small catechism, to be faithful and true? I do. A and this is the point where this is your confession. And this is where... I would ask you to, to seriously think. You, you've been in this class with me for, for a year. Do you agree that what I have taught you agrees with what the Bible says? And, and if you do, then gladly confess. If you have questions and qualms and aren't sure, well, don't just get confirmed because mom or dad wants you to. Work those out with me. And if you're not ready, we can hold off. And I will back you up if you want to hold off to your parents. But I think you guys are all ready to make the confession, as far as I know. So, um, but yeah, it, it, you're, you're saying this is, I think this is right. This is, this is what is good. Next question. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? I do by the grace of God. Now, this is fascinating because I get to point this out here in a, a beautiful way. You are learning something and experiencing something that, that many people do not get do not get to understand without this experience. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Confirmation means now you're welcome to the Lord's table. You've been properly trained. You can receive it. And the, the older generations before you have done so, and we have all of our lives been used to the Lord's Supper being offered like clockwork, whether the pattern of the church was every other Sunday or, or since I've been here for a while, Every Sunday, every Saturday, and Sunday, boom, boom, boom. You knew it was going to be offered. I do so by the grace, by the free gift of God. And the, the interesting thing about this is just with all, all the uh, COVID stuff going on, that pattern, that clockwork has been shaken up a bit. And uh, I, I, I hope that many of our, uh, many of our adult members might uh, now reflect on how the Lord's Supper really is a fantastic gift and not something just to be presumed. Not just something, oh, it's always there, so I'll blow off this week and what have you. And No, no, it's not necessarily always there, so it's really good to get it when it is. So, um, but yeah, uh, confirmation, again, isn't the end. It's the start. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Do you intend to really begin to actually fully be a member of the church, a member of this congregation. Uh, you'll also get to vote in the voters' meetings if you're so inclined. But And eventually, you might get to volunteer more, like the altar guild, or, or even later on being elected elder, or whatever. Lots of stuff. It's a start. 
<clears throat> Next question. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Again, this is something for your entire life. It's not... Um, I, I, I don't ask you, uh, do you intend to attend uh, Hersher School or the Coal City one? <laughs> Whatever it's called, I lost the name of it because I haven't had to pay attention. Do you intend, do you intend to uh, uh, go to middle school for the rest of your life? Yes, that would be horrific. No, this is for life. This is for, for the duration. If you're 80, I still expect you to, to know these same truths. Now, I probably won't be around when you're 80. Ooh, I'd probably be like 110. Yeah, I probably won't be around. But if you, if the Lord gives you 80 days, this is where you should live, where you should be in, in the word of God, in this faith, in this truth. Yeah, I do, by the grace of God. That's a wonderful gift. God grant me days and wisdom. Keep me in the faith. Next question. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? I do by the grace of God. Tend to suffer. Uh, the Christian faith is not always sun, sun, sunshine and daisies, and there will be people who will grouse about your faith, who will mock you, who will write you off. There will be things that you won't do, times that you won't go along with your friends when it be easier to. Because of your Christian faith, and you'll get kicked in the teeth for it. And God give me grace to let me be kicked in the teeth and not wimp out. And generally in, in the U.S., our, uh, our chances to wimp out are not all that spectacular. There are places where it are, where it actually is, will you suffer death. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Keep me, keep me remembering the fact that I am a forgiven and baptized child of God, that I am bound not just for a few days on earth, but for everlasting life in your kingdom. Keep that before my eyes and don't let me get distracted by other junk. That is the grace of God. <coughs> we would then continue. We rejoice with thankful hearts, doesn't that sound so great, that you have been baptized and have received the teaching of the Lord. You have confessed the faith and been absolved of your sins. As you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now note, this is the thing. Great, you're in, and now you can start to see what's going on. Because God is at work in you. And God has always been at work in you. And now you are in a position, you've been taught, you've been trained to start to see with the eyes of faith more and more how God is at work in you and through you and for you. And that continues on. And part of that is being together in the church with us, is, is hearing the word, is constantly learning, is receiving the supper. And that's a joyous thing. Then we get the instruction, the catechumens kneel to receive the confirmation blessing. I get to bless. The pastor places his hand on the head. Okay, well, no, not quite like... Some of you I might want to... Oh, oh. <laughs> no, I, I'll put my hand on your forehead. Uh, try not to mess up your hair if your hair is big. <laughs> the pastor places his hand on the head of each catechumen and makes the sign of the cross on the forehead while saying, Name, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthened you with his grace to life everlasting. The pastor may read a text of Holy Scripture as a remembrance of confirmation. And so you'll, you'll get the blessing in your verse. And, and again, this should not be a strange blessing to you because it's well, basically the, the same pattern that I do when you come up to the rail right now and you don't get to commune yet. I give you the, the baptismal blessing. And it's really the last time you'll get the baptismal blessing at the altar. Because after that, when you kneel at that altar again, at that rail, you'll get to commune. Now, that does not mean that this is the last time you might receive such a blessing on the forehead from me. Um, generally, I, give, I bless people that same way if they're going back to surgery. If you do have surgery someday and you're nervous and worried, I will come and show up and deal with, hang out with you beforehand, pray with you, 
tell you jokes while you're bored and waiting for the the, the doctors to all come because it's terrible. It's like, oh, be two hours early and then you get to like sit all nervous. I'll, I'll come with you, pray with you, help pass the time. And then I generally bless people as they head on out. And, well, you're, you're getting ready for surgery, so you're not supposed to have anything in your stomach, so I'm not going to commune you, so I will bless them. Good stuff. Um, but yeah, it's that transition. Congratulations, you get one more baptismal blessing with the rail. Now you get to commune. Um, after the catechumens have received the blessing, one or both of the following collects are prayed. So... Uh, let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, y'all, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and enabling them, God's bringing this about, with both the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that bringing forth the fruits of faith, they may continue steadfast and victorious to the day when all who fought the good fight of the faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And then, Almighty and merciful Father, in the waters of holy baptism, you have united your children in the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, cleansing them by his blood, renewing them the gift of your Holy Spirit, that they may live in daily contrition and repentance, and with a faith that ever clings to their Savior, deliver them from the power of Satan and preserve them from false and dangerous doctrines. That's why I taught you. And that they may remain faithful in hearing Christ's word and receiving his body and blood. By the Lord's Supper, strengthen them to believe that no one can make satisfaction for sin but Christ alone. Enable them to find joy and comfort only in him, learning from his sacrament to love you and their neighbor and to bear their cross with patience and joy to the day of the resurrection of their bodies to life immortal. Think about that in terms of, of our situation now. How many people do you know have you seen that are just absolutely freaked out beyond all comprehension because of all this weirdness that's going on now? Yeah, it's dangerous, but life is always dangerous. But you're in Christ Jesus, and you're bound for everlasting life. Whatever comes down this pike, whatever comes down the, the, the ways or paths of life, be in him. You are in him. It's all good. In fact, enable them to find joy and comfort in him, learning from the sacrament to love God and to love their neighbor and to bear their cross with patience and joy. Yeah, this is a weird time of, of things to put up with. But God grants you patience and God grants you joy even in the midst of it. Again, everything is a wonderful opportunity and a gift from God and we learn to see that. And in the moment it can be really hard. A lot of times we don't really get to see it till much, much later. But the Holy Spirit does give you faith and patience and works in you the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, so on and so forth. And it really is a beautiful thing. So, all right. Uh, to bear their cross with patience until the day of the resurrection of their bodies to life immortal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And then I say... Peace be with you. Which, if you paid attention to the Easter 2 service, and if you haven't, it's on YouTube. Go, or, yeah, it's on YouTube and it's on Facebook. Go watch it. Peace be with you. That's the point. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and you have peace. Amen. And then the service continues with the prayer. So you go back, sit on down, and then you end up setting up, going through the prayers of the church, starting the communion liturgy, and the first time, well... When we get to the commune that time, y'all get to come on up and commune. Uh, very simple. I will uh, hand you the Lord's body. You have two options. The one 99.9% .9 of the people here take is put out your hand. Generally put one over the other, so that way I know where to go. I will place the bread in your hand and say, the body of Christ given for you, and then you will... Okay, you probably don't need to chew that much because it's very thin, and, but you'll take and eat. Simple. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And then you'll get a cup, and it'll be take and drink the blood of Christ, given and shed for you in the remission of all your sins. And you will... You all know how to drink. At least water. Um, it's not a lot. Um... 
Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. If you're really worried about taking a sip of wine, well, one, first of all, remember, Jesus Christ is giving you his body and blood. That's the important thing. Two, you're stuck at home. I, a ask your parents, hey, can I try a sip of something so I don't, like, freak out the first time I get alcohol? They can do that. So, um, and in that, you will receive Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. You, you've seen the drill. You, you've seen how it goes. And what I will say is it is the most wonderful, ordinary, boring thing you'll ever go through. It's a wonderful thing. It's ordinary. It's commonplace. I will share now, I don't know if I've done this before. I, I will share now the, the story of my confirmation. I was confirmed in a class of 65 at an incredibly large church. And uh, I was... It was a large church where they had continuing tables. They didn't kneel at a rail. They basically had lines that you went through because they would have so many people that you just had to do that. And if you wanted the individual cup, you peel off it first to the right or the left. If you were on the right side, you peeled that way. And if you wanted the common cup, because many places will, instead of having individual cups, will have a common cup where everyone sips from the common cup. That's actually how I prefer. Um, so they had both those options. And if you wanted the common cup, you actually went up a few steps and then peeled off there. And it was just two different places. And um, I was third in line. And the second person was a friend of mine, Leah Souter, who I've since gotten to talk to a little bit on Facebook. I haven't seen her. I haven't seen her in person probably since that day because I didn't end up going to that church after confirmation that much because my dad graduated from the seminary and uh we, we had just communed and she she sat down she went through the common cup line just like i did she goes i'm so glad someone else did common cup with me yeah i know here we all do it the same way it's cool you'll come to places where they do administer the lord's supper slightly differently uh when you're a guest and visitor as you will have been confirmed you will generally be eligible to commune at other missouri Synod lutheran churches uh, if you are visiting some place, like on vacation or what have you, uh, it is common and customary to go introduce yourself to the pastor first and or one of the elders and say, I'd like to commune here, and uh, just watch how they do things. Every place does things a little bit differently, just in terms of how you actually distribute. And just watch, make sure you see what's going on, and go along and receive the Lord's body and blood to your benefit. That's what I got. Uh, once again, it has been a joy and pleasure teaching you guys. I don't plan on having the a dinner beforehand. Um, at least not the normal go and examine it, uh, simply because, one, I'm sick of my own cooking. <laughs> but, um, but I do think at some point in the summer when things get to normal, at our convenience, we, we should have some other shindig besides the, the right of confirmation. Um, I've been jonesing for really good restaurant food, especially ethnic food. So we might have to go go like plan a trip. And get, I'll take you out to dinner or something. We can all get something good and awesome. And by good and awesome, I don't mean Chuck E. Cheese. Although Victor and Ambrose would dig that. I, I mean, could go find a good Lithuanian restaurant or a good Chinese restaurant or good Japanese food. It'd be awesome. So what? Well, we're free. We, we, we receive good gifts from God. We'll figure, some, we'll figure something out. It'll be good. It's okay. Everything actually is all okay and good in Christ Jesus. So, with that being said, I'm going to let you go. Um, we'll figure out when we do stuff, when we figure it out, when we, when we can figure out when we can actually get together and, uh, and all that good stuff. And, yeah. Oh, I'll be good. So if you do have questions, I will. I am still willing to do a giant stump the jump uh, class. So if you guys send in questions, I'll do some things later on. But th this is, uh, you got what you got. If you got questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, have fun. Stay at home. Help out with the dishes. Blah, 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 blah. Have a good one, people.